Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Max. Let's do a little review tonight. I'm going to answer a viewer question. All right, the question said, Hey Max, I'm thinking about selling all of my triple QI because by my estimate, this is headed towards $10 and probably by December. I have a thousand shares at 80 cents. I think that means an 80 cent dividend and a reverse split happens. Then I'm at 500 shares for 80 cents again. I don't see how this is a winning ETF. Any thoughts on this? Thank you. All right. Yes. Great question. Um, first of all, to clarify, and I copy and pasted from Investopedia to make sure I was right, but the dividend is going to double. So the dividend, you're going to go to 500 shares, but $1.60. So in theory, it's supposed to be the same, but, but I get what you're saying. You're saying that it's going to be 80 cents again pretty soon because of, because of how fast this decays. I look at the decay in everything also, and I don't think it's going to get there by December, but it is something that concerns me also. And it's something you have to be aware of uh, when you, you know, when you trade these funds. Um, or you can, if you at least allow for it, you can, I think there's effective ways to manage this. And I'll, and I'll talk about a couple of those tonight. Uh, so it's taken nine months to decay this far. I'm thinking more like the middle of next year. I have a video called Max's Math and it talks about all this stuff. I figured that triple QI might split four or five times in 10 years. And that sounds bad, but reverse splitting is not synonymous with losing money, not in the high yield world. In the high yield ETF world, you can have negative NAV growth, you know, big time negative NAV growth, and he'll still have positive total return. So it's kind of crazy. It's a new dynamic. Um, okay. But there's other strategies and stuff we're going to talk about, which can help mitigate the damage and even kind of take advantage of it. Okay, so here's Max's math. It's the, what this is, is total return equals NAV return plus dividend yield. Okay, so if you know what your total return is, and you subtract what your dividend yield is, dividend yield, you know, pretty close, because these things average what they average, 50, 60, 70 percent. It depends. Different ones average different things. Well, the ones that average 60 percent, if they're on an ETF that has a total return of 15, you have to, you have to take 60 and minus 15. You come up with negative 45. It's 15 minus 60. So it's legit negative 45. Well, negative 45 is the NAV growth for that fund. Um, but the dividend has to come out of somewhere. And the only place it can come out of is the NAV. So it's simple math. I can tell you to the month when your fund's going to split. If you tell me how much the NASDAQ's going to be up next next year, then then we can look and I can make a chart of exactly when triple QI will split. You know, if I know the NASDAQ's going to be up 50% next year, triple QI is not going to split. If the NASDAQ's up 20% next year, it's not going to split. But if but it might split the, the year after that. They're on about an every year and a half schedule. So it's just kind of part of the part of the program. Like I say, and they still have positive total return, actually some pretty good positive total return. So it's definitely a new paradigm. Don't forget, total return uh, can be positive even on a stock that has negative NAV return. And that happens all the time. All right. Good news for my channel. A few of my family members found out about my channel and are now watching. I want to welcome them aboard. I've often said I couldn't even talk a few of my family members into these high yielders. Well, that's changed. I talked to one of my family members the other night and they have some yield max and some defiance and they're pretty happy. So uh, we talked about these funds for a while, but I thought this would be a great time to make kind of a quick recap video, of kind of my general thoughts on these funds along with the latest best practices that I'm using to limit risk and especially how I deal with NAV depletion. All right, here's some thoughts. My first thought is if you don't need income, don't use these. These are income funds. 
there's a huge opportunity or a pretty big opportunity cost to use covered call strategies or income funds in lieu of growth funds. So I say if you're gainfully employed and under 50, don't touch these. Your best bets are growth assets or growing a business or growing your career. I don't believe these will let you quit your job at a young age. I know it kind of looks like that on paper, but I don't believe it uh, actually works out like that in real life. And I'll try to justify that here in a little bit. But OK, so number two, let's not over allocate. I say 20 percent at the most for high yield. Remember, high yield ETFs are similar to fixed income and belong in the fixed income portion of your portfolio. Many financial advisors recommend a 60-40 portfolio, which is a very rational, sane, uh, you know, uh, reasonable portfolio allocation. So it would be 60% would be equity, usually growth, I think. But it could, it could also be value equity stocks. But 60% equity, 40% fixed income, typically bonds. I say 60, 20, 20 is a very reasonable allocation. Take 20% of your bonds and diversify into a different type of fixed income. This fixed income isn't as sensitive to interest rates as that other one. So it's a, and, and it has some other advantages as well too. So I think it's a good diversifier. You don't want to totally drop the bonds, even though it's tempting because these yield more than bonds typically, but the bonds are a good diversifier and, uh, and a good and can be a good hedge. All right, let's not yield chase also. So let's say we have a million dollar portfolio. So that would that would mean $200,000 worth of bonds, $200,000 worth of covered call funds and the rest in equities. Okay. Um, I say, you know, if you had, if you were talking that kind of money, I'd say $20,000 in at least 10 of these tickers. If not, if not 20 of these different covered call funds, just to try to spread out the idiosyncratic risk as much as possible. And I would also mix up the underlines. So if you had a high yield portfolio of, of five funds, and let's say the funds were JEPQ, Bali, Fepi, YMAX, and YMAG. Okay. You have five funds that are basically you know, uh, charging you to buy the same five stocks. There's no diversification there at all. And that, and that may be fine. It's concentrated. Sometimes you want concentrated. If you want concentrated, that's concentrated. Okay. So how about this one for a little bit less concentrated and more diverse? So we put JEPQ, which is the NASDAQ's it's underlined, then USOY, which is the new defiance fund with oil as it's underlined, or actually USO as it's underlined, TLTW is a covered call fund, been around for a couple of years, I think, or more. Um, its underline is uh, TLT, which is a bond ETF. And then YMAX, its underline is tech stocks. So we have a couple of those that are tech stocks out of the five funds, but the other ones are oil. Oh, and I forgot to mention Bitcoin. The other underlines are oil, Bitcoin, and bonds, but they still all sell covered calls. They all generate money through the passage of time. Jay Pestricelli, the uh, trader for these funds, he's he's a trader for a lot of these funds. He's a sub advisor. And uh, he always says that he likes the one strategy he can count on is that or not strategy. The one thing that he can count on on Wall Street is that tomorrow comes after today. So these strategies try to monetize that uh, that that idea. The other thing is. um the yield is just important to remember the yield is actually what causes the NAB depletion. I should say the yield's half the problem. The other half the problem is sometimes the stock won't cooperate and just goes down. Covered calls are also a neutral to slightly bullish strategy. If you're in a bear market or if you pick the wrong stock at the wrong time, i.e. Tesla, which is underlined was Tesla at the wrong time, your NAV will appear to decay. In actuality, it's mostly just the stock declining, but it, you know, it's, uh, it's not fun. Every ETF and stock pays a dividend out of the NAB. So they all have this problem to differing degrees. The ETFs that pay these gigantic dividends like 5% every month need a 5% recovery in the NAB every month to offset the dividend. And that usually doesn't happen. And that's why some of those funds kind of have a trending uh, a trend down and to the right. 
at least as far as their chart of their nav goes. The chart of their equities going up and to the right. To me, the equity, the total returns what counts, but all right. So the, another real important thing is not to confuse yield and total return. So that, let's say there's a brand new fund coming out. There's one every day or there's four every day. Let's say it's supposed to pay a yield of 100%. Okay. So that doesn't mean that you double your money in one year. The total return could be vastly different or even negative. 50% yield doesn't mean you get paid back in two years. The good news is it could be sooner. But remember, yield can be high and total return can be negative at the same time. Yes, some of the yield max funds are going to pay themselves off quickly. NVIDIA, Kony, and maybe one other or something, one or two other, but there's like 23 of them. So that means what, 23 minus four, was that eight, 18, 19, 19, I guess, that, that aren't doing that. So, you know, they're, they're outliers. It's like anything else that comes to picking the stock. And I'm not trying to be cynical, but I'm just saying if you really knew, if you were that good at picking stocks that you picked NVIDIA and Kony out of the out of the yield funds and, and Misty, because you're that good at picking stocks, I mean, that is awesome. But just go out and, you know, buy leaps on the underlines, buy NVIDIA leaps, Mr. Leaps, you know, and, and you'd make, you know, way more money and you'd have plenty of income. So, but that I'm being sarcastic because of course we you don't know what you don't know. Those were hot this year. They may not be hot next year. That's where the allocation comes in and the diversification. So I also made a metric called true yield that gives me a more realistic uh, view of what these funds do. I, I look at the funds option strategy and I look at the payout policy that each fund does. And then I compare that to the payout policy and the option strategies of JP Morgan their cover call funds and another uh, company called Global X and they're kind of a gold standard. So based on that, I, I isolate the, the different factors. and I try to strip out the good part of the option, just the, you know, the parts you're looking for. So uh, some people believe my number is too conservative, but I think it was a pretty decent. Uh, I think it was a pretty decent try. You can see here I have triple QI around 8%. So you could also think of this if the NASDAQ was flat in a year, like made 0%, what would the total return be of triple QI? And it would be around 8%, I think. So, because these funds, uh, part of the dividend, they, they actually monetize a, a lot of the up action. And of course, they get penalized for the down action. So these funds do actually, the ones that do pay a higher dividend, it's because they have a more volatile underline and they're able to capture a little more upside. It doesn't look like they do, but I, I watch it every day. That's why IWMY is statistically a little better off. Uh, same thing with ULTY. They're just trading, you know, more volatile underlines. I have, I'll have a video, a new video coming out on True Yield, and I'll look at uh, the, I'll, I just made a True Yield number on some of them. I'll probably make a True Yield number on the rest of them. And then I'll also look and I'll compare the True Yield number. My my True Yield, true yield number is like a preseason ranking. It really means nothing. It's just a, it's just a metric. Um, but I'm going to compare that with, that with how the funds have actually performed and see how close I got. So look for that video. But here's the most important thing. Most importantly, drip some of the distributions back into the funds. Two thirds is the number I came up with based on a study, based on a video that I wrote. And it was based on a study that I read and I referenced in that video. All of these high yielders now depletes when the ETF goes ex dividend. When you reinvest two thirds of that month's dividend on ex dividend day at the new lower price, it brings your average price down and it negates or mitigates much of the ill effects of the NAV depletion. I should say it substantially mitigates the effects of the NAV depletion. Not all the way, 
it's pretty effective. I found it to be. A lot of people believe in uh, half, reinvesting half of the dividend. Uh, Sylvia Jablonski, the COO of the company, said 80%. A lot of people she talked to were reinvesting 80%, taking 20 But I think it's important to pay yourself. I really think it's important to pay yourself and not just drip the whole thing back in. There's a pretty big opportunity cost when you use these things. So if you just drip the whole thing back in, especially because these aren't very tax efficient, you're you're just basically, you're just basically switching it to a growth fund when you drip everything. If you drip two thirds, it's still, I, I look at it as still an income fund because on triple QI, two thirds would be you, you reinvest 40% of the dividend for the dividend 60%, but two thirds of it would be 40%. So that would go back into the fund at progressively lower prices every month. Well, 20% would be yours to, to keep and spend buy other assets with pay down debts, live off of because the 40% is taking care of the bad stuff that can happen in theory to a large degree. So the 20% is free and clear. So that's what's exciting about it. That's still really good money. That's way more than the risk-free rate. Now, what I figured when I made my true yield lecture is, is actually the, the real yield that these things can get was a little bit less, but still bonds pay 5%. Risk-free rate is 5%. So if you have something that pays 8% with steady nav, or, you know, something like IWMY that's yielding around 20, you know, or, you know, any of these are, they're, they're all doing, they're, most of them are doing double the risk-free rate. And, and some of them are doing a lot more than that. So this is definitely impressive to me. These guys are definitely onto something. Okay. So remember this, um, dripping's a good idea, even if it wasn't for NAV depletion, just disciplined investing every month, especially on X dividend, especially at the low of the, you know, at at the new lowest price to have the effect of buying the dip or have the effect of keeping your average price, you know, keeping your average price low. It's, it's a good, it's a good habit to have, even if it didn't have anything to do with NAV depletion or if it didn't have anything to do with these high yield funds, it's a great idea. When you combine the two, it's a really good idea. So, okay, don't over allocate. 20% is enough. Don't yield chase. Don't think you're going to double your money just because it's 100% yielder. Drip, or at least be willing to drip. There's other reinvestment strategies. There's one other one I really like. And uh, my friend Jerry's doing it right now. I won't say his last name for privacy, but, uh, but what he's doing is in months, the fund loses money where it loses ground in the nap, you know, he looks at the trading results. He just reinvest everything in those months. He reinvest a hundred percent of whatever dividend it pays. But then in a good month where the fund, you know, uh, picks up some nav reserve and makes a profit. And that happens. That happens lots of months. It's going to happen this month for triple QI. It sure looks like it happened last month. Right. Or is that two months ago? That was really, anyway, I get the months mixed up, but, uh, but in those kind of months, then, then you could take the whole dividend. Okay. But in any event, you end up reinvesting about half when you do that strategy as well, but it has the effects of just having to do it in down months. So that's a different way. Uh, that's a different way to deal with the same problem. If you're worried about nav depletion, that's a strategy that, that negates a lot of it. This is such a great time to be an investor. I always say it's the golden age of option trading specifically, but investing generally really for the retail trader. Um, You know, we have penny wide bid ask spreads on the underlines. I like to trade Uh, and we have like, you know, two penny wide uh, bid ask spreads on, on the options in those underlines. I mean, that's just crazy. I've traded options before lots of them that were bid at $3 asked at three and three quarters or something back in the day. And I probably ended up paying three and five eighths or something, if not the full price, the full boat. I mean, back in the day, and when you're paying a 50 or a hundred dollar commission, 
even if you're even if you're a broker like I was, there was a ticket charge that was, you know, thirty five dollars or something. So uh, you, you just could not make a living doing it. Nowadays, you have a fighting chance. It is uh, just because I'm kind of uh, pouring cold water on the thing about these things paying for themselves. Some of them will. And if you use these things wisely and just allocate a portion in your portfolio, I think these are just, you know, game changers, absolute game changers. Um, also, think about the, all the analytic tools we have available nowadays. Think about just think or swim. It's been available for 20 years, but that, that's an incredible, you know, an incredible piece of software. It's taught a whole generation of option traders about, you know, about risk and, and, and given them a tool to evaluate risk with. So the ironic thing about the golden age of option trading is thanks to the high yield revolution, which is all these high yield ETFs that do the covered call strategies. So thanks to that revolution, you don't even need to trade options anymore to trade options. We have ETFs nowadays that use extremely sophisticated futures and option strategies previously only available to hedge funds. Hedge funds are not accessible to retail investors with smaller accounts, not to mention hedge funds charge two and 20. So the two, two is a 2%, you know, yearly fee and 20 means 20% of the profits. So even without considering having to give them part of the profits is twice as expensive as the most expensive funds now, which are about a point, you know, the defiance funds are a point. I mean, so they, it's a it's a crazy good deal on a comparative basis. SFAL is a very sophisticated strategy using futures and options that hedge funds have done for year, years called harvesting roll yield. But a retail traders never going to do that. It's it's way too complicated and way too risky. There's a lot of other hedge fund replication strategies available today in ETF wrappers. I'm going to cover a bunch of those over the next few weeks. Covered calls have been around for years. Investors have had access to them for years if they if they do them themselves. And then when if you're a qualified investor, uh, a broker would do them for you. But it's a great time to be a, an investor, especially a covered call investor. All right, guys, have a good one. And remember, uh, anything you hear on the Internet from me or anyone else, you know, check with your own financial planner, get your own financial advice. The Internet's a great place to do research. It's not a great place to fact check. Um, a good planner's worth his weight in gold, I think, but I may be biased. My family's full of financial planners. Um, you know, my dad was a planner, but he's retired now. My brother-in-law was a financial planner. So uh, the Convexity family's full of planners and investors for that matter. You should hear us around the dinner table. When we aren't talking uh, stocks, we're talking politics. All right. Remember, I was a planner, too. Uh, and I always say probably a lot's changed in 30 years. I'm trying to give good advice. And uh, but like I say, definitely check whatever you hear. This stuff's important, but all this stuff can be known. Like I was talking about the analytical software, this all can be known and evaluated nowadays. All right, guys, you have a wonderful evening and I'll talk to you later.